uh, a very warm welcome to uh, Lisa Lobry de Bruin, who is uh, giving this seminar series for us today. Um, so uh, Lisa is a, a associate professor in soil health and knowledge sharing at the School of Environmental and Rural Science at the University of New England in Armadale, New South Wales. Yeah. And uh, we're very fortunate that Lisa is visiting CCRI for uh, two weeks. Um, we've already had some really interesting discussions and she's kindly agreed to give this uh, seminar presentation, which is titled Soil Governance in Australia and the Priorities for Engagement with Farmers. Um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing this. So, Thank you. Um, over to you, Lisa, if I can. I'll to... just uh, share the screen so you can see the presentation. Um, I'll start from the beginning. Yeah, I know it's one from the beginning. Um, I'll go backwards, but uh, Jane yeah. kindly introduced <laughs> my topic um, and it is very very lovely to be here it's been some years in the making and I suppose COVID did make it quite difficult to travel overseas especially for Australians so it actually really is wonderful to be here and thank you for being so welcoming to have me and I it's it's been a real um, really great so far so thank you very much um, and I just wanted to explain a little bit about me. Um, I might just move that. <laughs> um, I actually grew up in Western Australia um, and I did my both my honours and my PhD at the University of Western Australia. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if we should actually do this so you can see me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I did my PhD at the University of Western Australia, except that's very big, sorry. Just wrong. Um, yeah, that's not going to work either, sorry. I just, <laughs> uh, maybe you can just avoid seeing me then. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just sorry, that's really confusing. Let's minimise. Um, anyway, sorry about that. Um, so I, I did my PhD in Western Australia, which I looked at the role of ants and termites in soil modification in agricultural and naturally vegetated soils. And then after I finished my PhD, I went to work in Tasmania, where again, I looked at earthworms and how they actually are affected by change in management, which was irrigation in dairy pastures and how that influenced their activity and composition. But for the last 30 years, I've been at the University of New England, where I've been working on a, a range of um, land uses and examining the role of soil biota largely. And then increasingly, I got more interested in how farmers were actually recognizing their soil health and if they could pick up the early warning signs of land degradation. And then that morphed into how farmers use soil testing in Australia, but also uh, looked at that in America. Uh, and increasingly, I got more PhDs looking at a range of topics, but I suppose the one that's most relevant to the audience today is, is soil carbon management of long-term practitioners, of rotational grazing, and the effects also of tree planting uh, on soil biota, because we often focus on the above ground biomass rather than the below ground. Um, and also I teach uh, undergraduate students and, and train uh, high degree students as well. So that's me in a nutshell. Oh, no. <laughs> this is now not moving. Um, dear me. <laughs> oh, there you go, sorry. Um, okay, so the backbone of my talk obviously is around soil governance and I wanted to talk about um, the emphasis is often on, if you like, on governance, managing it in terms of policies and strategies. Um, but for me, I think the reality is that land is often privately owned and it's really up to those individuals who, who manage that land, was what they're going to do with it and how they're going to care for it. So in Australia, we 
we have a lot of land that is, is in agriculture, about 54% is under grazing, and it still continues to be vulnerable to land degradation. And we want to know how these farmers and also cropping farmers can actually maintain or improve their, um, their soil condition. So that ability, I think, is, has been much reduced because a lot of um, practitioners have, have less access to soil knowledge and information that they, is relevant to them. And also uh, the social networks that sort of drive that change, if you like, have been diminished over the years. So I wanted to talk about what can be done about that, but also what are some of the initiatives um, as, as moving forward? Oh dear, this is going to be confusing. I don't know what to do with this thing. Can I minimize this? Um, take it out of the way. Can I just push it? It should, it hopefully will go up. Oh no, sorry. Um, but importantly, I think we want to know that. Um, Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. That's just blocking my vision. <laughs> is, is that um, regional organisations, so if a lot of you are not familiar with Australia, this, this occurred more than, well, 20 years ago, actually, uh, where they, they, the federal government decided they wanted to have more control over natural resource management, which essentially is state-driven. So they arranged these regional organisations of which there are 54 and, and essentially a lot of them don't really much align to biophysical boundaries. A lot of them, except for this area through here, you can see relatively look like catchments but they're more land use orientated. And so places like the Northern Territory, just one big regional organisation that has to be managed but the, the driver for this really was to actually funnel uh, funding from the federal government through various different programs. Um, and, and it created uh, a project of vocation, if you like, of natural resource management. They also vary in the fact that some of them, like in New South Wales, are like seen as the fourth tier of government. And they are actually, um, Low, the light local government authorities um, and then there's also other states like Queensland where they have no actual statutory uh, obligations. So what happened when this occurred in 2003 and a lot of commentators and academics have said that there was a commensurate decline in, in land care um, organisations but also um, a splintering, if you like, of extension staff away from their former agencies into these um, new places. So the most recent development that I wanted to share was, of course, the National Soil Strategy. Again, I seem to have lost my, um, which is here. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. Do you know what I can do with this, Jane? Oh, sorry. Can't hide this at all. Can I minimize this? Sorry. I don't know. Can I? Sorry, yeah, I'm fairly. Um, hide. Hide. This one? Hide. Fly, fly to me too. We've got that one. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't know. What I... Oh, dear. sorry. I don't look like I'm that. Obviously, I have done this before many times, but <laughs> looking like I'm a real amateur. But anyway, so this is the National Soil Strategy. It was developed um, and it was released in May 2021, and it's, it's really starting to branch out now. And so this strategy was is designed for 20 years. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is really the National um, Soil Strategy Action Plan, which is only for five years, but it's, it's essentially to kickstart some of these goals. And so if you like, there's a three uh, goals, and I'll just quote them. They're the prioritise soil health, empower soil innovation stewards, and strengthen soil knowledge and capability. Uh, and these three goals 
um, are underpinned, if you like, by these guiding principles, which are, are, are wonderful in my opinion, but also um, sometimes these, uh, some of the cynics would say, sounds good, but what does that actually really mean? And I think one of the areas that we as soil scientists often debate and, and, and find hard to agree on actually is terms like soil health, um, as we know. And the other one is how do we actually increase and maintain soil organic carbon? So there's a lot of debate about how permanent it can be and how can you actually in increase it over time. But it should be said that this is in a vast improvement because the research and um, there was in nearly 10 years ago, a soil RDNE strategy, research development extension strategy that was uh, designed to be part of this, but it, it faded away. And so it's great to see that it's finally come to some, some fruition. Now, when I showed you the, um, the previous uh, regional organisations, there's a very strong synergy between the National Soil Strategy and what they're calling the Regional Land Partnership Programs. These programs are actually funded in a separate bucket, if you like. They're from the, the National Heritage Trust. But it does, they do, they do re rely on each other. And I circled two of the important outcomes for agriculture, which are talking about um, improvements and protecting the condition of soil. Oh dear. <laughs> How did I do that? Um, <clears throat> uh, protection of soil and biodiversity and vegetation. And also the sixth outcome was um, increasing the capacity of agricultural systems to adapt to climate and actually improve the information that they can demonstrate that they're actually being sustainable. So these two things actually rely on each other. Um, and the other important thing I think to note is that the funding that's gone into this program, which is the Regional Land Partnerships, is only over five years. So again, it's this projectification, um, it's a quite a big bucket of money, $450 million, but it's only over five years. And for agriculture, it's funded 66 projects. Um, and what that means is it's a competitive process. You know, lots of these different regional organisations are trying to compete for the same money. And in the end, they, they had, I think, around <clears throat> 159 projects for the four environmental outcomes and the 66, as I mentioned, for the uh, agricultural ones. And they only went to 54 regions. So you can actually see that probably in each region they might get one <laughs> project. Um, so it is, it's not, it's spreading it thinly across the, the nation. Okay, <laughs> that worked. So the next one is to say, where, where does the society fit in? And the Soil Science Australia actually became quite an important leader in that one of the, 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 one of the objectives, which was to address in a national soil action plan, address the shortfall in technical and professional expertise and skills uh, among the sectors engaged again in soil health. And so it, 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 it piggybacked a little bit on an existing program. So this program was about drought resilience adoption and innovation hubs. And we established eight regional coordinators for those. And these eight regional coordinators then became the sort of leaders in each state um, for training and so on. And in reality, um, I'm, I, I'm in one of these projects um, for the Northern New South Wales and Queensland, where we're looking at um, encouraging farmers to gather more information on soil and soil health. So they've tr tried through a series of mechanisms, different funding mechanisms, and they've tried to coordinate it so that um, we can actually have an impact at the, the, lot, the ground level on landholders and how they assess soil health 
um, and increase their awareness of soil health. But 32 projects over <laughs> a very large country is not going to have a huge impact. And I'm very mindful of that is that uh, we are just scraping the surface essentially. Uh, but also again, the Soil Science Australia is really um, leading in terms of improving that um, knowledge base, especially for those people who are working with land care groups or involved in those regional organisations who are not that knowledgeable on soils. So they've set up this uh, accreditation program and the key one here is the registered soil practitioner. Um, it will be run out. Uh, we have a national training leader, but essentially people will be, um, people who are already certified soil scientists will be able to train um, people to become registered, registered soil practitioner and they will get these core competencies as well as um, some specialist competencies in, in particular areas. And you can notice these ones, of course, may become important if, if we do move towards more soil carbon uh, market assessment. I suppose what I wanted to also emphasise, though, is that our human capital, which I feel is underpins a lot of this, <laughs> is, is, uh, is, is, is shrinking and we, we find ourselves in a predicament so this is not new data, obviously, but it was the only data I had which looked at gender uh, and also looked at experience. So along the bottom here, we have experience in soil science um, in, in years. And also what I've looked at is trying to give equivalency to academic roles. Obviously they're not employed as academics, but just to give you an idea of seniority, of people, so how long they've been, you know, the type of role they have. Um, and if you like, the, the blue and colours at the bottom are more junior roles, um, and you can see student and so on. So the take home message from this really is that in, in for men, there are a lot of men that have vast experience, greater than 30 years, but are working in quite a, a range of roles. Um, but Essentially, they're, they're probably close to retirement. As you can see, there is already a block that responded to this survey that had retired. Uh, in women, we, we're, we're lacking uh, experienced women greater than 20 years in those variety of roles and, and probably in those more senior roles. Um, but you can also see that a lot of women are occupying the role of project officer and often that is a short term role, it's only three to five years. Um, and I think the implications here are that people nearing retirement or these people that are close to retirement are not necessarily going to be available to help mentor or train the new graduates that you get. So this is a a real gap, I think, is, is how do we keep hold of some of that institutional memories and, and experience uh, and then be able to use that training ground um, for the, <laughs> the next lot of um, the next lot, the next generation. So this is probably also covering the same point a little bit. Um, but it was also just to emphasize that in terms of the farming population, as well as the soil science community, you know, predominantly they're older. So we have more than 50% of soil scientists that are over 50 years of age. Um, we also have farmers that are in 2011, again, not new data. So this is <laughs> some of the problems we're dealing with, we don't have up-to-date data, um, 53 years, of age, but also they tend to stay in farming longer. So a lot of farmers are still farming uh, at you know 65 years and over, compared to just only 3% of the people in other occupations. 
Um, and the other one is that I wanted to point out was the, the lack of investment in extension and training. So most of our soil scientists from the uh, DNE survey that the society undertook were either in research, 39%, or were actually in postgraduate training, 26%. So we have only a few committed to extension, 12.5%, and even less in teaching. So the concern I have here is that that loss of experience and expertise and how we actually managing that. And the National uh, Soil Action Plan is actually trying to address that through that registered soil practitioner training program, but they're also relying on someone to actually teach that. <laughs> so they're, they're relying on, in some cases, retired people to come back and um, teach those, those registered soil practitioners. So in summary on, on the state of soil science human capacity, I think the organisational changes that have occurred in Australia, the regionalisation, the, the, if you like, the, the de divestment by government into markets and, and asking regional organisations to take the, the you know, competitively um, ask for money, has actually shrunk our, our expertise for information delivery engagement. Um, we don't really have a good succession plan for an ageing workforce, which then it creates more pressure on those who, who are left behind. Um, and soil science education training is unlikely, I think, to fill the gap for that loss of soil uh, science expertise. The other thing I've noticed is that the research um, has been funneled into different research and development corporations rather than a landscape scale activities. So you'll have grains research, you'll have meat and livestock research, but it doesn't actually look at the whole landscape. And I feel that just widens the gap or the chasm between researchers uh, and engagement. And the National Soil Strategy Action Plan, again, would like to see more private-public partnerships, um, but I'll, I'd be interested to see how that um, pans out. So my question was, you know, where do we actually place engagement? So this is a very simple little circle, and I suppose the, the point is where do we start this um, process? And there's the two photos here, and, and often I suppose these types of photos are familiar to us, but then usually the engagement is at the end of the cycle. So, you know, researchers have developed their research ideas and they've carried out the research, and then they engage as they are here with a group of farmers showing off their crop variety trials and how well they did. So some may say, well, this is what's happening here, but actually it's the reverse. You know, we have here a farmer, uh, Michael Taylor, in the background here, who's talking to actually a group of soil scientists, talking about how he manages his farm. Uh, he's, he's doing rotational grazing and he has a, a diversification on his farm, the sort of activities he engages in. So what I'm suggesting is that this engagement um, and getting a deeper understanding of what farmers actually do and how they do things should happen first. Then the research can be developed with that in mind um, and knowing what the farmers are interested in researching um, before, before we actually undertake the research. And I know there's a big push for farm on farm research and farmer research happening more these days um, but often it happens where we go out with the ideas <laughs> and say can we use your farm whereas I think we need to actually start that discussion in the engagement first and develop the the research ideas with the, with the farmers um, more closely and I know it's not an easy thing to do, so, <laughs> but I think it will be more fruitful in the, in the long term. 
So again, this is a, I know this is a pretty busy diagram, so I'm not expecting you to, to take it all in at all, but it, it was an example from my um, PhD student, Narul Amin, where he looked at a causal loop diagram. He was looking at the social ecological system of soil carbon management for long-term practicing uh, graziers of rotational grazing. He, he did a, a series of interviews first with the, the farmers he was working with, and then he ran some workshops based on the interview data that he'd collected. And what he asked them to do in the workshops was actually to prioritise the features that they felt either helped or hindered their soil carbon management practices, they were meant to be retained. And interestingly, no farmers chucked out anything. They had kept all 51 features, which obviously makes this a very busy diagram. Um, and what I wanted to emphasize <clears throat> was the vast range of outcomes or what people refer to most commonly now as co-benefits of soil carbon management. So the Soil carbon management practices were in the middle. What were they doing to um, manage their soil carbon management? But the farmers were very much focused on these outcomes and mostly because those outcomes directly linked to soil health and production potential. As you can see on the social side, the, the governance or the support by government in funding was, was a long way <laughs> from um, those outcomes, but obviously did interact. And the policy itself had very weak links, as you can see uh, by this dashed line, to, to their soil carbon practices. So they a lot of these farmers were actually ineligible for soil carbon um, credits because they weren't doing anything new. Um, and so they weren't very attracted to the, the scheme in the first place. But the other point of showing this is that we also asked service providers, which included you know, agronomists, um, soil scientists, a range of service providers to to also do a causal loop diagram with the farmers' 51 features um, of their social ecological system. And the important reason I'm mentioning this is that um, change in income uh, from the service providers, they felt was a big motivator for getting involved in, in soil carbon management. Yet the farmers did not identify that as a, as a motivator. So the reason I'm saying this is that we need to do some of this sort of research where you look at the social ecological system where you try and un unpick what is it uh, that makes these things work so that when we advocate a particular practice, we can actually see how the farmers would, you know, what is the drivers and how would it actually work for them in, in their present day um, practice. I think another important part of this uh, is really looking at the social networks for information flows and, and connectivity. So where are farmers actually getting their information from? Um, where are they actually learning? Who are they learning from? So I think it's a really important part of that puzzle. And also how do we improve engagement? So who do we need to, um, bring into the, into the room in terms of uh, who engages with farmers. And I suppose for me as a, a long-term um, person interested in how farmers behave, um, the, this one just reinforces that a lot of farmers are learning or getting information from other farmers. Um, so that's the strong tie really is, is there other farmers, but Disappointingly, the regional organisation uh, and land care are um, not as important for gathering information. And I think this is partly because their weak ties, they haven't formed a strong social network with farmers. And 
in my state, New South Wales, part of this reason is that the NRM regional organisation is also a regulator of farmers. So that trust, if you like, is um, not always there in particular uh, sectors. So the other one is what else could be done? And I suppose this is, again, it's not new data, but, um, you know, I'm not a recent project that I'm involved with that the ag agronomist um, as a paid advisor is, is increasingly important because largely there is no other um, person out there. And um, that they are in this study also to um, important for no-till adoption, but also just being part of a farmer group. So the majority are looking either at other farmers or nearby um, local um, people. Yeah. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was you know, how do we know who we're engaging with? And I think, I know this is an old diagram, but it's it seems to be just as relevant as it was when it was first developed um, by Rogers. Um, and I think the problem is we, we don't actually know <laughs> because we don't ask who we're engaging with. I, I, I feel we probably are engaging with the innovators or early adopters and this, number I put up here um, is 25% is showing how many farmers in Australia soil tests. And so I'm just suggesting that <laughs> the majority of farmers who are soil testing are probably in this sector here um, because they are more willing to take risks um, and, and embrace new ideas. The other interesting thing about this graph is it, um, or conceptual graph, if you like, is it doesn't talk about what is this timeline at the bottom. And I feel like in Australia, for instance, with no till, which is now pretty much full, fully you know, embraced by farmers in, in Australia, uh, it took probably 40 years. So this timeline can be quite long. And I would just say that for certain things like soil testing, this number has not changed in probably 20 years, which gives you some indication that some practices, and probably Jane knows a lot about this not as well, that they, they won't necessarily change that quickly. Um, so we have to keep that in mind and to understand who we're engaging with, I think we need to ask those questions and make sure we do know who we're engaging with uh, in any, any project we undertake. The other one I wanted to emphasise, which is part of also part of the National Soil Action Plan, is the uh, priority three, which is talking about looking at the current and new structures for knowledge sharing, um, peer learning, and collaboration that facilitates soil stewardship among land managers. And this was a small, this is from a project I did with looking at uh, workshops held by regional organisation. But I still feel there's a lot of compelling reasons to have um, farmer to farmer learning and creating those social groups that you hope will continue to meet in an informal capacity. I don't think you can make them. Um, but I th also think that those sort of experiences where people sit in a room together are more likely to uh, embed themselves. They give also greater immediacy and feedback to the people organising those um, workshops or processes. I know the downside is that it's um, the transaction costs are high. You know, they're, they're, more, they're harder to organise. They take time. Um, and also the regional organisations, as I mentioned before, have to get funding for this. So it's not like they can do that as a part of their recurrent job. They actually have to go out and compete with a whole lot of other people to get funding to run these workshops. So I think that needs to change. You know, we need to, and I don't know how that changes, but I think that needs to change that organisations need to be able to funded to do these sort of activities without having to ask for money to do them in the first place. 
The other really important bit, and I suppose this is um, an area that um, um, that I, I, I'm particularly interested in is the role of soil information in governance and engagement. And again, uh, there's two priorities from the National Soil Action Plan and they're about developing new tools or making tools available, but also importantly, harmonising the national approach to collection, aggregation and analysis of soil information. Um, obviously that's quite tricky to do. And if you look at this graph, um, this is from Queensland and it was um, Andrew Biggs who put this together and we talked about the different programs that help fund that data collection. You can see that most of the data in Australia was collected between uh, this period here uh, over 20 years. Um, and then there was a decline and then there was an increase over the, another uh, nearly 10 years as part of the National Soil Carbon Program. So a lot of data was collected by project by project basis um, and not really considering how they would interact or um, be harmonised. Um, the reality is also that for uh, each state in Australia, we have different ways of presenting the data. Some is, is, is publicly available, like uh, this is New South Wales, and this is called eSpade, which is a little symbol up here. It's, um, it's electronically stored data. It has over 80,000 soil profiles, but it is patchy. So, you know, you, if you're the farmer over here, all you have is your locally derived information. Uh, if you're the farmer over here, you have a whole range of different data layers that you can look at. Um, I suppose the interesting thing is how do farmers interact with these uh, data repositories? Um, some of the data was part of research programs has been put into this uh, data repository. Uh, even the most recent project I'm working on will do the same. But it, it's um, the, if you like, testing the idea that farmers will um, put their data in hasn't really been um, fully, fully tested. Um, but also the, the new National Action Plan was hoping that this would be one of their, uh, one of the goals that they wanted to achieve was to, to the project I'm working on and several others um, would, would put all that data back into the National Soil Information System. So this is the New South Wales one, but there is a national one as well and that would help farmers in, in further. Um, but I wanted to just explain that I think some soil data has limited, limited, limited usefulness, if you like, especially on behaviour. Um, if we take the example of soil testing, it's pretty one dimensional. We have mostly soil chemical properties we have very little data on soil physical um, nature and, and very hardly anything on soil biology. So we can't, it's often, it won't incorporate anything on observations. So like ground cover um, and those sort of things or ponding and, and other indicators. Um, and it's very rare to see it collected outside the production zone. So it's largely in, in a paddock. And um, from my own research, I know that basically farmers don't <laughs> sample very often. And if they do, it's a very shallow depth. And they also don't keep hold of that data. So what will happen is data is collected for a particular purpose for the growing the next year's crop. And then basically it's, it's put in a drawer and it's never looked at again. So I maybe I'll just skip over this because I'm looking at the clock and I'm <laughs> running out of time. Um, but this is just to summarise the sort of points I made about data. Um, and I think the most important one is that it's very much tied to funding. And I suppose that's a recurrent idea that, you know, all of this is based on what is funded and what is not funded. Um, 
So this one, I, I won't go into great detail, but what I wanted to emphasize was this action learning cycle, which people, you know, there's lots of different cycles like this, of course, but often organizations that are working in NRM, you know, they plan what they want to do and then they act on it. Um, the work that I did for this organization showed that they very, didn't spend a lot of time observing what was happening and what was required by the, the landholders in their area. And then they never reflected very much on how the event went and how the education activity was received um, by the participants. So I think to complete this action learning cycle, we need to move beyond just planning and acting, but actually observing and maybe reflecting and then plan what we would like to do. So we need to complete, complete that loop. Um, and for me, um, this was something I did, I engineered myself, but for a group of soil scientists um, to talk to farmers about their soil testing and what they did. Um, but importantly, with any um, activity, we need to collect meaningful data on audience experiences so that we know what we want to do next time. We need to make time for listening to the audience feedback and being responsive. We need, again, I'm talking about time a lot, aren't I? But we need to actually reflect on what really happened. And so often we, we miss that. We, we tend to keep rushing headlong into different uh, activities without actually spending time to um, share those learning experiences and, and reflect on what worked and what didn't. Um, yeah, all right. So I just wanted to sort of, summarize some of those um, opportunities, I feel like how we need to meld the face-to-face -face connections and online connections, because I feel like they both have pros and cons. And importantly, I think we need to balance them out because I feel like putting everything online is, is a little bit hard to know how it's been received. We don't really have dedicated teams to curate, organize and respond to feedback from audiences because we rarely know what the audiences make of the information online. Um, so that's why I feel like we can combine the two and also reinvigorate some of these social networks so that we can actually have some immediate and direct feedback. Uh, would be really important. Um, I suppose the difficulty is this roadblock of limited funding to support networks and, and the pressure it puts on those very, you know, as, as I said, the shrinking or the less, you know, scarce human resources that are trying to do this. So we, we, we need to sort of look at that seriously in terms of how we can, how we can actually combine the two, I think. Um, and so for, for me, the overall outcome, the, th the vision I would like to see at the end of this is that we build a much stronger research practice ne nexus. So the scientists and the practitioners are uh, uh, more on equal footing, if you like, so that we can actually communicate what we know is credible local knowledge on soils and it, it connects those audiences in very meaningful ways to those policy initiatives, rather than um, just assuming we know what farmers want, we actually understand that more deeply. Um, and hopefully the end product is that we increase the capacity to manage soils uh, sustainably for everyone. So I'll, I'll just end that there, uh, but I do have a little bit of a, I'll leave that on the last one. These are some of the papers that help me think through these ideas, but obviously, um, yeah, a lot of <laughs> with my name. But anyway, I just love that. I'll leave it there. And I might try and bring back um, the audience, <laughs> which I sort of had to get rid of at the time. Now I have to find them. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, thank you very much, Lisa. It's been really yeah. interesting and I think also quite topical. Uh, so uh, we have a yeah. chat.
Sorry, I'm just getting yeah, yeah, I'll I'll leave you to it first. No, I don't want to share. If you if you just click exit and uh, exit. Oh, where? oh sorry. <laughs> you think I'd know this by now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, where's my vision? I'm just gonna put that speaker. Is that right? is that how I do it? Yeah. So, uh, is it okay to um, start the? Uh, yeah, I, I can't see us, but it, I'll, I'll read it out for you. Uh, okay. So, the first question is uh, for Charlotte: To what extent does soil-related citizen science occur in Australia, particularly on longer-term projects? And if this is happening, does it face similar challenges um, to broad engagement and outreach? Yeah. Sort of not being co-designed, being extractive, meeting the needs of both soil scientists and the agricultural land managers, citizens themselves. Yeah, so uh, that's it. Yeah, the, the citizen science in soil is, is probably... And there's a few projects going on in Australia. We have uh, one of my colleagues actually does saw your undies where you get um, cotton underpants and you bury them and you see how they degrade. And he actually has a, had had a really big impact. It's like a one person band really. <laughs> but he's managed to uh, gain a lot of credibility. He's worked with a lot of cotton farmers and now he's moved into the whole circular economy with um, um, you know, got taking the cradle to grave sort of thing where, you know, the cotton that's put into sheets then comes back and is, is shredded and buried in the cotton field. So you're actually getting this circular economy. Um, so Sawyer Undies is one. I know we've, we've, Sydney Uni has tried the tea bag one, but I'm not sure how well that was received. Um, uh, seriously. Yeah, so I think it, it, yeah, it, soil citizen science hasn't been as, has, hasn't been as successful, I don't think, as, as some of the, you know, like birds and other, other, you know, um, to do with entomology and those sort of things have actually been better, but it's, it's also relied on some very passionate individuals. Um, and if Oliver Knox wasn't doing it, nothing would happen. So I, I think it does have some challenges. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. We have another question from um, uh, Chris. Uh, do you see a role for facilitator role within the research practice nexus? Mm -hmm. And how do these groups, both online and in person, get together to create the trust that is required? Yeah, um, uh, my recent experience is actually working on this soil extension project um, where I found that in some areas the agro local agronomist was really um, important to us um, in terms of attracting farmers to, to, do the, to work with us on the project um, and actually joining in in the, the actual project, which was actually looking at a soil constraint ID program for identifying um, soil testing positions in their paddocks. Um, but of course they're private agronomists. So they're <laughs> the facilitator role, which I think you mean is, is actually someone in, in a regional organization. Again, it's lack of people we, we, and then they have to be funded. So it's, it's, it's almost like a, a I say more like a not not a virtuous circle, like a vicious circle, where the funding's not there to actually employ the facilitator. The facilitator uh, does, has no job security, so they they move on quickly, and so they don't necessarily bond with the groups that they're maybe charged with looking after. So yeah, I think it's a whole thing of creating a more secure job position that is is recurrent, it's not short term. I think that, I mean, these are major rethinking how we fund and how we resource um, NRM in Australia, for instance, but I don't think it's that dissimilar to what's happening here either. Well, great, thank you very much. And then we have two questions from Jane. I don't know, Jane, whether you would like to um, sort of ask them um, directly or whether you prefer me to read them. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so maybe I'll read. Uh, how would you, your ideal see the 32 smart farms working? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I can ask yes, this. Yes, yes, okay. Go oh, on. Sorry. Hi. Uh, amazing talk. I'm based in the UK. Uh, so, so soil science isn't 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 my expertise, but I, I do have a very strong linked interest. And um, you mentioned maybe it's my confusion, but you mentioned about 32 smart farms working right at the start of your talk. Yeah. Um, I wondered if if it was those 32 smart farms that you were uh, talking about or whether or not there was a... No, 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 sorry. I, I was quite interested in that, wondering yeah. if that was an ideal you were working towards in order to exchange knowledge. And then I thought, yeah. well, how how would you see that working in practice? Because farmers mm -hmm. are, are working so intensively and usually, just in my experience, that they are quite... Um, uh, sort of an insular type of person, you know, um, communication to the wider world, you know, isn't, isn't that easy because of the nature of the work which they do? Are, are yeah, we... I think that, I'll, I'll explain because I've probably mis misled you a little bit. The 32 Smart Farm Soil Extension was like funded project, so that was just the title of the funding <laughs> programme. And so essentially there were 32 different projects spread across Australia who were funded to work with farmers. So not necessarily, act, you know, we, we had to go and find these farmers. Um, and we were trying to reach out to farmers who had very little soil testing experience. So the idea was not to go to the innovators and the early adopters, but actually go to the people who, who lacked who didn't understand soil testing and, and wanted to learn more. So that was quite a hard task, actually. We thought we, we had, for New South Wales, 60 farmers we, we had to um, go, uh, enlist, if you like, <laughs> as part of the project. Um, and we used a lot of those at local agronomists to direct us, but we deliberately went for, um, and we, we made sure we understood this, that we went to, we did a, um, entry survey so we knew exactly what the soil testing experience was of the farmers we were talking to and so we made sure that they were uh, less experienced uh, than others. Um, citizen science, I, I feel like there's, it, it can actually help. I know I've met farmers who did soil your undies with Oliver and they really found it engaging. Um, so yeah, I think it could help. It could at least be a segue into um, grabbing their attention into other ways. But yeah, it's, it's, it's hard graft, you know, you have to, Australia's a big country, <laughs> getting a, around some of these, um, we did our initial action learning workshop with farmers and we would spend seven hours driving to do a two hour workshop <laughs> and then seven hours driving um, back again. So, you know, you, you're investing so without the project money, we wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. So it's can not. I, yeah. I understand that. So 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 can I? Sorry, can I just ask another? Yeah, question? sure. Yeah, ve very briefly because <laughs> yeah, okay. we have and two that, minutes that's left. Really, to see whether or not there's any opportunity following that um, to exchange global knowledge to help with some of those uh, training yeah. knowledge. Facts, or at least, I mean, I'm sure you try and do that already. Um, but I, I I just wondered. Um, if you, you know, whether or not it's, it can be more structured, if you like. Um, in, in what way? Sorry? I, do, I don't know. I mean, you, you mentioned about the training gaps there. So, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the kind of the global knowledge that's accumulated in, in other. Yes. Yeah. I think harnessing local knowledge is one of the real tricky things um, because a lot of lot farmers um, don't, how to put this, sometimes they're not that confident about their local knowledge. Um, in fact, I think they've become uh, codependent a lot on other people giving them advice. <laughs> and sometimes they don't trust themselves to actually uh, know what they're doing. So they become more, uh, because a lot of this, I'd say a lot of the agronomists and the soil scientists in Australia tend to um, diminish the importance of their local knowledge and I, and I think I've tried in my research actually to do the reverse is actually trying to empower them 
to actually appreciate that their local knowledge is, is valuable, uh, even if it's not written down. So that's the hard part. part. They don't have a lot of uh, formal, you know, written down knowledge. It's, it's largely from their experience and they just take it for granted a lot of the time without realising how important it is. So, yeah. Great, thank you. We have time maybe for one last question. So I don't know if there is a question. Um, <laughs> from Thanks, Chris. Even though my technical skills are really appalling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've oh. got one, Katrina. Yes, uh, yes, go, go yeah. ahead, Jane. Kind of following on from your last point that you made, um, where you were talking about the need to, to get farmers to come up with the, the research ideas mm -hmm. and then work work with those. Mm -hmm. And um, we found on an EU project that we worked on called Valerie, where we we were asking farmers to do that, to come up with the re research um, mm -hmm. ideas. And actually they, they struggled because right. they're, they're not used to thinking in that way. They're used to, as you say, yeah, the, the, the relationships coming, coming out. Yeah. So it, it's almost as if there's, some reticence yeah there is that reticence yeah. and maybe there is a task there to, to help the farmers in yeah the development. I, th I think that'd be like a but see the interesting thing australia and i think you you maybe you're more sympathetic to region ag but i think in australia they're not there are scientists who don't want to study it but farmers who are practicing it so mm. that would be an interesting one to resolve mm. um to try and yeah well, also to get money to do it is quite hard too. Mm. Yeah, but but yeah, I think I think one of the like I could go back to the rules to um, his his um, diagram, which is very busy. And the first time we said to the farmers after they picked the points that they wanted to keep um, the features. Um, when we said to them, can you draw a diagram showing how they link up and they all just went, oh no, <laughs> we can't do that. And then we started off very small. We put soil carbon management in the middle and we said, okay, what's next? And so they started and they built it really slowly. And mm -hmm. the proof of how they were, how they felt about it, I think at the end was that they all took a picture of it. Mm -hmm. And so they thought they couldn't do it a bit, bit like your It's farmers. more of an iterative they, process. I can't do that. Yeah. And you do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And then we, we said, look, just let's start off. And then, and then the second workshop, because we were a little bit expecting it the second time, um, that they, they we, we, yeah, we started off more, yeah, more gently. Mm -hmm. And um, it, and I think they, they, uh, talk to it a lot more easily um, but I think it is trying to change the power relationship yeah. maybe and because I suppose they're so used to people telling them what to do rather than asking them what you want us to do yeah um, maybe that's it yeah well thank you very much uh, thank you and thank you very much for a really interesting talk uh, I think, you know, uh, having more time, uh, there'll be more questions, but unfortunately mm -hmm. we are running out of time. Yeah. So thanks well, again. Here for, and so thank well, you I'll everyone um, else for participating and um, have a great summer. We won't mm -hmm. have a seminar in August and we'll see you back in October.